Eventually, she decided, Tara Sue, that she wanted to offer workshops in her store. And she was like, you know, do you mind, you know, teaching some crystal healing? And I was like, okay. <laughs> I, 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 that was not, you know, on my radar. It was not, I just made crystal jewelry. And then she asked me, do you want to do these crystal healing workshops? And I was like, okay. Aloha to our beautiful listeners and viewers on the other side of the screen or in your earplugs. Welcome to the next episode with Abundance in Action podcast with Christopher Lakshmi Ditton as a host. And I call myself a new time coach. I believe that we each have a treasure box inside. And once we open it, we can start to live our dreams on our terms. And today I'm so, so excited to introduce to you to Tina Dubois, who is actually a very exciting, uh, another superwoman, <laughs> and uh, who, with who we can dive really deep into self-exploration and self-growth and so on. And me and Tina, we actually met each other through another Facebook group um, where people were you know, networking and starting to ask how can we help with uh, each other and so on. And it's a beautiful thing with those challenging times that we can, you know, communicate online. There are no limitations, no like, you know, um, excuses to not connect and help each other. So here it seems also other than the podcast, there are many other things how we can co-create. So welcome, Tina. Thank you, Crystal. That was beautiful. I really loved, I really loved meeting you at this, like how you shared that we met through this networking Facebook group, because you're right, like with the technology that we have now, there's no reason why we can't connect with people all over the world. Yeah, it's so true. And you and I, we have so many similarities. And that was why it was also so fascinating to listen to some other podcasts about you. And now I will uh, read a couple of things what you have been dealing with recently, but also your prior uh, things which you did are very similar, like um, to kind of like what route I went, uh, a little bit different, but uh, we have similarities there. So I want to dive deeper into those things too. And uh, your life, when I kind of zoom out and look at your life, is a really good example how someone can really put, you know, their talents into action and then turn abundance into action. So, so that's why you are such a perfect guest in uh, our podcast. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, Dina is the founder of the Metaphysical School, and this is a video education and community website with a faculty of passionately enlightening teachers from around the world, dedicated to helping healers, seekers, mystics, and seers ignite their enlightenment journeys in a safe and supportive environment. Tina is primarily a seeker herself, but also a healer and intuitive empath. In 2010, she went through what she calls an intuitive awakening, where her intuitive and empath abilities woke up after a 15-year nap. Having zero coping skills to function in an energetically overwhelming new reality, she put her science degree learned research skills to use and sought out the tips and techniques she needed to not only function but flourish as an intuitive empath. Tina founded Metaphysical School to share the lessons she learned with those with similar stories and to create a video education and community platform for metaphysical teachers and students to connect so we can all heal, learn, and grow together. And oh my God, that's like so like <laughs> powerful. How does it feel to listen to yourself? Like really uh, overwhelming, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I introduce myself, I usually say I'm the founder of Metaphysical School, a crystal and sound healing facilitator, and a teacher and student of various metaphysical topics. But what you shared is a lot. <laughs> wow. Yes, it sounds like quite the journey. That's what yeah. it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. And uh, maybe we could start uh, going back to uh, those two academic degrees. Like uh, some of my listeners may probably have heard I studied social anthropology 
in Oslo University, and then later um, I did visual anthropology as my master's um, in Tromsø University in Norway. And then I did also exchange uh, studies in Cape Town University as part of my bachelor's in social anthropology. And this was a five-year journey where I was so infused with academic like thinking and way of like, you know, behaving. And I was part of all kinds of like student boards and like all kinds of like political stuff too. And after those five years, I was so empty. I was like, I I didn't have much of like creativity, like all the creative ideas which I had were always like cut down. This is not right. This is not the way you do the academic stuff. I was so like fed up with that, that I was like, I'm never gonna even like touch or think anything like, you know, academic. (laughs) And a couple of things which I thought like, okay, so, Uh, I got, of course, lots of knowledge, lots of experience. I'm very grateful and also very international experiences, you know. But um, two things I've been thinking recently, I didn't get any extra knowledge. One was about like finances, abundance and how to cope in life, which I think most, you know, regular university degrees don't kind of offer still. And then secondly was also about like food education, which is like one thing which I'm like kind of diving into myself right now more. And I was like, oh my God, like I spent like five years of my life and those very essential things were not even like, there was not even like a selective course I could take, you know, so essential. Like where have we like, you know, (laughs) grown to as as, uh, humanity and the world. But you, you have actually like, even like more crazy uh, degrees you have, Uh, in genetics and also masters in neuroscience like oh my god that's like completely into the other extreme so um so in my case just just to wrap up my part of it uh after the uh five years of the academic world I actually basically closed that door and uh, started my entrepreneurship like founding my company in Estonia and starting to help people through that and For many years, I didn't even think I did much or did have any much of like that anthropology knowledge in it. But now when I look back, like all of my years, all of my work has been like straight on deep dive to anthropology because it's human nature. I'm learning how to cope better and then teaching people the same thing. So all in all, I think it went into good use, even though not in academic sense, but (laughs) I've used it. And I think you in the same way, have kind of had a similar experience. Um, what, what's your story? Like, can you tell some backstory to your uh, academic uh, journey? Well, I spent 10 years in university education and most of the time was really physically difficult for me. So as you said in my introduction, I had this intuitive awakening in 2010. Well, my university years were from 96 until 2005. And then I spent another um, almost a year in a vet school program. But um, what I realized during, well, after the intuitive awakening happened was all of my time in academics, um, all of the intuitive parts, the empathic parts of me were shut off. I didn't, um, I was missing a huge part of who I was. And the catalyst for that was a tragic event in my childhood, which, you know, (laughs) is a pretty common story for people whose intuitiveness or or, um, empathy turns off. But what I realized in school was I was sick a lot of the time. I had to take a year off in my second year of my bachelor's degree because I had a three month migraine and couldn't figure out how to get rid of it. Um, I couldn't, I went to, you know, I went to neuro neurologists and I went to a bunch of specialists and nobody could figure out what this headache was. I eventually got rid of it by, you know, cleaning up my life and eating better (laughs) and, you know, trying to have less stress and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, during my master's degree, again, I was hit with migraines. I had migraines um, four days out of five. It was really difficult to function. And what I learned was I was suppressing this huge part of who I was 
And that's what um, that's what made me sick. But what I am grateful for my science background <laughs> for teaching me is it taught me how to do research. It taught me how to learn, especially in my master's degree. Um, my master's was on uh, was neuroscience and it was primarily on studying multiple sclerosis or MS because um, I was determined to find a cure for that <laughs> until I got into academia and was like, oh, wow, that, you know, that takes a really long time to find <laughs> treatments and cures for diseases these complex, right? Um, but yeah, so what I found out was, what I learned was how to learn and how to do research. And so I've kind of applied that to all of the other aspects of my life. Because science, uh, biology specifically, it does not teach you about metaphysics. It doesn't really teach you about energy. Yes, physics would, but I didn't take physics in school. I took biology. Um, but yeah, I was like, I needed to know once this intuitive awakening happened, how do I cope? How do I function? How do I live in this world that I'm being, you know, bombarded with all of this energy and don't know how to deal with? So that's what I mean by I applied my science degree learned research skills to uh, metaphysics. And then I was totally enamored with metaphysics. It, it really was crystal healing that um, that really awoke the um, intuitive parts of me, or reawoke anyway, because I always had them. I was just suppressing them. And what, I, what I've done with that is opened metaphysical school so that I can teach what I have learned to other people who are going through intuitive awakenings, who are going through um, any type of process where they're looking for answers, specifically in the metaphysical realms. So, um, yeah, but I also decided I didn't want to be uh, my own school. I didn't want it to just be the school of Tina. So I have found and invited teachers from all over the world to join me in metaphysical school. And we make videos to teach about all different aspects of metaphysics from crystal healing to astrology, divination, all that sort of stuff. And yeah, so now I'm trying to live abundantly through teaching because as a seeker, it's part of who I am. It's part of my soul path to share that information with others as well. So hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, very, very beautiful. So uh, when I listened to the other podcast, what I really loved, um, one uh, thing which came out, which is kind of also similar to my life, you know, uh, how I think so many times our life is um, giving us opportunities to receive those hints and um, invitations to start to uh, do something or explore or share something which is actually a gift or a talent inside of us but what we may not even consider as that so in my case for example was the story uh, my listeners have probably heard that before but just a little short uh, version when I went to Hawaii and I had a fear of depth um, to go into the water but if you want to swim with the dolphins there you know in the ocean you have to go into the deep water you know it's like at least uh, 100 meters or deeper you know and then I went through a water um, class water therapy class and I dissolved that fear and once I came back, one of my clients said, hey, I heard you went through your water fear and you don't have that fear anymore. Can you help me? And I had no idea, like, how to help others. And I said, okay, but I'm a really open person. So if I get an invitation. So basically, that was my one of my life purposes, knocking on the door. Crystal, here is one of your talents. I want to be expressed. I want to be... Like, you know, I want to stretch my legs and my arms and I want to come out to the world to share your gift like me and, you know, help the others out there. And um, I'm a positive and, you know, um, very excited person. So I was like, OK, let's let's see what's here. And she luckily also had a pool at home in her cellar. So we started to do those sessions there and then 
after some time, uh, we developed into like a complete like water modality and like other things came of it uh, to the point where I was actually doing it also uh, in Mexico in five star hotels. So, so just think like I had no idea I had that, you know, talent. So in your case, you had Christos who were like kind of one of the first ones who kind of knocked like this on the door and one thing led to the other. Can you share that story and um, how that was like kind of like a little cornerstone for your uh, one of the first bigger like intuitive uh, talents coming to the surface and saying, I'm ready. Are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the the teaching part like you came from an invitation so I uh, how crystal healing was introduced to me was in my last year of university I got incredibly injured I got a back injury uh, from some school activities and basically I had a herniated disc and I went to, you know, I went to the hospital, had an MRI, and I went to orthopedic surgeons, and and I was in rough shape. My, you know, diagnostic imaging didn't show anything, but I was in extreme pain. My nerves weren't working properly, and um, that kind of went on for a year. So I didn't really walk. I didn't. I stopped running. I couldn't drive. I couldn't even sit in the car. I had to lay down. All of the work that I did was laying down with a laptop on my lap. Thankfully, I had work to do. Otherwise, I probably would have gone squirrely <laughs> because I have such an active brain that it needs to be doing something. So um, yeah, but I was in pain for a year and nothing I did could make it better. The doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong. And eventually a friend of mine recommended I go see an energy healer and speaking you know at the time I was someone who had done 10 years of science at you know university I had a master's degree and I was like energy healing okay I've, I've tried everything else massage therapists physios chiros you know GP specialists I've tried them all nothing's working okay I'll try this energy healer so I went to this energy healer her name's Jan Hansen and she's in Calgary Alberta and uh, she specializes in body talk and quantum healing. And when I walked into her office, well, I limped into her office. I was walking with a cane because I, one of my legs didn't work properly. I walked into her office and her office was full of crystals. And I was like, oh, crystals. I had loved crystals as a child. And when I was in my late teens, my substitute mom, was also very into crystals. And so she shared with me this love of crystals. And yes, I was somewhat enamored with crystal energy, even when I was a kid, right? But anyway, I walked into this um, energy healer's office, Jan's office, and we did the session. And because I was enamored with the crystals, she was like, well, let's do some crystal healing on you while you're here. And I was like, okay. So I lay down on the table and she put crystals all over me and she put this beautiful smoky quartz, this tiny little tumbled smoke, smoky quartz that you wouldn't think anything of when you when you saw it. She put it, um, it was in my hand the whole time. And I, I loved it. She, like I was covered in crystals, but while she was doing her session and we finished the session and I was like, okay, that was, you know, that was interesting. I, you know, was trying to be open-minded to it. And when I'm, you know, paying for the session she goes back into her office and comes back and she's like I'm feeling called to give you this crystal and it was the smoky quartz that I had been holding and I was enamored with and I was like flabbergasted because nobody had ever given me a crystal before like this is a professional healer who just gave me one of her tools and I was like well okay thanks like I was just overwhelmed with gratitude went home, went to bed that night, and I slept with this crystal in my hand. And I woke up the next morning with all of these energy reception frequencies wide open, and I had no idea what to do. I suddenly could feel other people's emotions. I could feel energies. I could, everything was overwhelming. Going to the grocery store was 
super painful. I would turn into a zombie because I was just overwhelmed. And what I realized was it was this crystal. It probably also could have been the energy healing itself. It's hard to, you know, differentiate these things. But I, I actually worked with this, you know, piece of tumbled smoky quartz and I still have it. It's on my headboard, <laughs> on my bed. It's always near me. And so I fell in love with crystal healing. I was like, well, if this little stone can do this, you know, what else is there? And so then I started learning about empath skills because I was an empath and I needed to know how to deal with it. And I started learning about crystal healing. And then I learned about chakras. And this was all super new to me. Again, science background. And so here I am diving in to metaphysics and the etheric and all of this esoteric stuff. and I learned about crystal healing and I was like, this is my jam. So then I took, you know, a five day, 40 hour crystal healing course with a wonderful friend of mine, Rebecca Fuller, and learned all about crystal healing. And I started making crystal jewelry because uh, I'm allergic to metal. And so it's like, I'm allergic to wearing metal. It's very uh, difficult on my skin. And so I started making macrame jewelry and <laughs> and so then I was this custom gemstone jewelry artist and I had a business where I did custom gemstone jewelry um, because all of my friends started asking, oh, can you make me a piece? Can you make me a piece? And I was like, sure. So I would make chakra bracelets for friends um, and they would have all different types of beads in them, gemstone beads. And this new crystal store was opening in my town. And so, you know, shy introverted me goes to this crystal store that's opening. It's not open yet. And I met the owner, her name's Tara Seymour. And I was like, I was wondering if you, you know, when your store opens, if you might be interested in selling my jewelry that I make, I make custom pieces. I can make, you know, pieces that, that you can have in your store and sell. And she was like, let's talk about that. So we talked for like two hours <laughs> about, about lots of energy things and about crystals and because she also loves crystals. And, and we talked about how I took this crystal healing course and I then started working with her and I helped her open the store. And so I got to meet all of these new crystals and it was so much fun and it was a wonderful time in my life. And Eventually, she decided, Tara Sue, that she wanted to offer workshops in her store. And she was like, Tina, do you mind, you know, teaching some crystal healing? And I was like, okay. <laughs> I, 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 that was not, you know, on my radar. It was not, I just made crystal jewelry. And then she asked me, do you want to do these crystal healing workshops? And I was like, okay. So then I offered some crystal healing workshops and it started with introduction to crystals. And then I made a workshop on pendulums. I made a workshop on um, balancing the chakras with colors and crystals. I One of my favorite workshops was um, shape specialties and master crystals. I love that one. I can't wait to make a video about it. <laughs> and then I made a workshop on empath skills. And so I offered these a number of times to her store. And what happened was um, I knew I was going to be moving from that town and I couldn't do my crystal healing teaching in the store anymore. And where I was moving to where I currently live is this really tiny town. It's 3,600 people on the side of a mountain in British Columbia, Canada. And uh, yeah, crystal healing workshops just aren't really a thing here <laughs> like it's not something that I could you know make a full-time business out of so I was like I think I'm going to teach online and so hence the um hence the conception and birth of metaphysical school that I've been working on for many years and so that's kind of how teaching happens that it was an invitation from a friend of mine to, do you want to share your knowledge but what I've learned since then is um, we just we recently offered a masterclass called um, Intuitive Awakening Masterclass. And in it, I share the steps along a person's soul path. And 
it doesn't matter what your soul path is. For metaphysical school purposes, we identify metaphysical archetypes as the healer, the seeker, the mystic, and the seer. And there are, I've identified five steps along any of those soul paths. And the last path, um, the last step, sorry, I call the empowered archetype. So that might be the empowered healer, the empowered seeker. And in that step is when you are called to teach because teaching is the next level of learning. When you learn something, you only learn from your own perspective. But when you teach it and people start asking you questions, you get questions from other people's perspectives that then you have to answer. And so that's why I call it the empowered step because you are empowering yourself, you're empowering others with your knowledge and wisdom. And it's the next level of learning because it's the next step where you get to dive deeper into the tiny, minute de details that you might not have covered when you were learning it yourself because you suddenly have these people that are asking questions that you have to look up because <laughs> when you're a teacher, it doesn't mean you know everything. It just means you're ready to share what information you have and you want to dive deeper into the next step. Again, one of my I say, it, I say it quite often, <laughs> is, you know, you teach what you want to learn. And so teaching is um, a profound step on your soul path when you get to dive deeper into whatever topic it is that you want to teach. Yeah, I so agree. Um, I had uh, another experience. I, for years, started to kind of explore the inner family archetypes, you know, inner child, inner woman, inner man. And then I got so good at it that people started to also approach me again with questions like, how do you do that? Like, could you help me to, you know, um, have a good relationship with my inner family? And I had never thought about it, but it's like, OK, I can try. I have no idea. I've never like taught it to anyone yet. And then came out like this beautiful coaching program, which has been now in functioning for like five years. And um a beautiful experience for so many people like four months like we go through each of the archetypes uh, each month so what a beautiful experience again invitation you you come and share and i really like what you said that you teach what you are uh, wanting to learn yourself like right now i'm learning more about nutrition and i'm already like almost having ants in my pants like well how how can i like teach it like oh my god this has such an impact on me, like all of my clients and friends and family, everyone needs to know this, you know, because it's so much better, you know. And I also like another thing you said, um, which is going into the line where I think the whole world is now turning with all the chaos we are exp experiencing and so on. So that intuitive feminine is basically teaching us to really trust that you know invitation or that call which is coming like even if you don't know right away you know how to set uh, things up or what to do uh, next and so on but you trust like your uh, example was sharing you know you went to that shop and the person was like okay can we like see what's possible here and then you took it one step further and then before you knew it, you were already teaching classes there instead of just selling uh, the jewelry. So yeah. <laughs> that's a beautiful story. Like, oh, my God, like, um, you know, how this beautiful talent of yours with crystal healing was there, like waiting for you to be like grabbed and like pulled out to the surface. And, hey, I'm here. I want to serve you and your dreams. <laughs> Who else wants to play with me? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and then. You're like, OK, let's go and play. Let's say who else wants to play? <laughs> and then um, it turns into this beautiful co-creation. And now what I really also like with your example is that you took it next to the next level. You know, you you thought like, oh, not to just have the school for me, but um, I can go out there to find those other amazing teachers and together will be more powerful we'll all have our talents. And then you put all these together. We are like super women all together, you know, helping people. And, and men, we have some male yeah, teachers. Yeah, sure, of course. <laughs> and um, and this, this is a really new time way also, like, you know, cooperation. And, you know, you had hunted those people down, basically, especially in the beginning. So, 
you, yeah, you look years. up. That's yeah, true. so it was a process, you know. And then you also, you started to create that, you know, container, like, okay, how will I do it? And you shared with me, you showed me what you have done. And of course, I've I've done my websites. We have a platform we, where we have our courses and classes and Facebook groups and stuff, What what's there right now. But you are even there, you are like a, a real entrepreneur taking it to the next level, like, hey, like, let's have the community also in one place and a different platform and you built it from like zero it's like oh my god like <laughs> that's another <laughs> you know masterpiece but all in all um during this process i think in one of the podcasts again came out a very interesting thing you learned one thing like you know uh, something about deadlines maybe you you can share the story about it and i think it's such a good example when i was listening to this like oh my god it's such a good thing whether it's, you know, writing a book or getting your program together or whatever it is, once you put the deadline, even if it's just yourself, it's accountability thing and you start to kind of move your legs a little more, probably. <laughs> I did, I was against having deadlines in the beginning. I, um, like I mentioned, I spent two years recruiting faculty for metaphysical school before I started working um, on creating the website. And the recruiting uh, of teachers and recruiting of faculty went really well and really smoothly. Um, I how that worked was I would just, you know, I would send emails out. I would do, you know, I would find potential people that I would be interested in learning from on Facebook or from Google or from whatever platform in person, even uh, business cards from metaphysical shops that I went to. And I would just send an email and I would say, you know, I'm, wanting to create this school. It's going to have eight core subjects and it's going to be about video teaching um, and we're going to have a community. Are you interested in joining? And I would, you know, I have this contract all made up and and yeah, so for the first year, um, I was pretty happy with my success. I think I recruited uh, 40 or 50 teachers in the first year and um, my goal for launching was always going to be once we have 40 videos, then we can launch. And in that first year, I got three videos from my 40 or 50 faculty. And I was like, this is going to take a really long time to launch. <laughs> and at the time, I didn't have a deadline. I was like, oh, if you, you like the project, you know, take whatever time you want to make your video and submit it to me. And and. Yeah, with the three that came in, and I had made four videos in the first year, um, I had seven videos after a year of working on metaphysical school. And I was like, this is going to take a really long time. So after the first year, I asked my faculty that I had, you know, what would be motivating to you to create your video course for the school? And unanimously, the responses I got back was, give us a deadline. And I was like, but I didn't want to give people a deadline because <laughs> I'm really not about um, uh, hmm, instigating fear. And so I guess it, I guess, it, you know, it's personal stuff, fear of deadlines and missing and failure and all of that sort of stuff that is pretty quintessential to being a business owner and an entrepreneur. And I just decided to get over it <laughs> If this is what my faculty is asking for in order for, you know, to create motivation and inspiration to make a video. OK, so I instituted a one year deadline. You have one year to make your video. Otherwise, you are not, you know, you're not part of the faculty anymore. And the teachers were like, yeah, that's great. And in the next six months, I got quite a few more videos, actually. So it did help. Um, I created more videos, I think, after the first um, year and a half, we had uh, close to 25, 30 um, videos. And the faculty was growing. It grew up to the size of 90. And after the first six months, I was like, you know, I'm going to make this deadline shorter. <laughs> six months. So if you become a metaphysical school faculty, you have six months to produce your first video. And this is actually going really well. Um, 
there are, you know, lots of opportunities to teach at metaphysical school, but you have six months to produce your first video. And this is, you know, it's giving motivation, like my faculty asked for, to produce their videos. And every teacher, like every new teacher that I recruit into the faculty is like six months is such a long time. I'm never going to need that. Some of, most of them do. <laughs> yeah, so it shifted also like energetically, yeah. you know, people maybe uh, come in now who are more courageous or more experienced, and then that's also less work for you. Because in the beginning, as I understood, you also actually tried to help them. So, you know. Oh, I still uh, help them. Yeah, okay, I still yeah. help. So. It's, part of, it's part of my support for teachers is I want metaphysical teachers to share their knowledge. And if they've never made a video before, I am here to help them do that. So I've created a video production uh, PDF, like a video production guide. I've created a checklist for people, for teachers before they send their videos in. I do one-on-one -on -one calls with teachers to help them, you know, get set up, answer any questions they might have. I help with video editing because that I've learned is the, the, uh, the hardest part <laughs> for many new teachers is to get it's the tech right it's the it's the technical aspect of of video production and so i i'm i'm still happy to help teachers to create their videos because what i want to do is i want to give i want to help teachers with the skill so that they can in turn use that skill to promote themselves their businesses and share their knowledge in whatever way works best for them so this is a way to help business skill building so that they can then use that in whatever way um, they want, whether that's, you know, Facebook lives or, <laughs> or Zooms or StreamYards or making their own, you know, teaching videos so that they can make their own online courses and make signature programs. You know, if I can help people like our teachers to develop that skill, then that really lights me up. You have no idea. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of the things it's one of the great joys I get out of metaphysical school is to see someone who had never made a video before um, produce it. We have one teacher. Her name's Anna Garcia. She lives in Sydney, Australia, and she's a coach. Um, she's a law of attraction coach. And she took a picture of my video production guide printed. It's 55 plus slides. Uh, like I just made it out of PowerPoint. She printed it all, had it on her desk, she took a picture of my slides, you know, my images on her coffee table. And when she sent me her first video that she had never made a video before, and it's beautiful, it's gorgeous. She's created a two video series on the law of attraction. Um, it was wonderful. And now I see her videos in other places. She makes, she has, you know, some videos on um, her Facebook. She's got TikTok going now, like she <laughs> It, it's really like blossomed what she does in her business. And I was like, I'm so happy. Like, I'm so, I'm so, um, I'm so happy for her that she uses that skill in her business. So yeah, there's a lot of aspects to metaphysical school. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, really amazing to be there for people to encourage them to step out of their own created uh, boxes and start to use um, some of the things they didn't even know was there, you know. But now uh, let's go and touch a little bit about um, your awakening story um, when, when you were kind of awakening with the super sensitivity and empath. And I think so many people are going through that uh, process right now. Is there any um, like suggestions and pointers? Of course, they can come now to your school and learn all about it. But I have a video on Empath yeah, Skill. <laughs> yeah, but other than that, like maybe two or three first steps, what they could do uh, to start on that journey. Um, do you have anything you could share? Absolutely. So I have, mm, I have lots. My favorite, uh, my favorite tip for newly awakened empaths would be to develop a practice of daily energy clearing. So it's a trick that I learned. Um, it took a couple of months, I think, of research to find it, but it's really 
it's really quite simple and there are multiple ways of doing it. So what happens as an empath, one of my friends, Tosca, says that um, she calls it being spongy. So a, a very common, uh, a very common hmm, complaint, I guess, of empaths is that we absorb other people's energy and it can accumulate, right? So we're quite spongy. We absorb other people's stuff, other people's emotions, other people's pain, and we have to be able to get rid of it. And so as a new empath, if you don't know how to get rid of it, it just accumulates and accumulates and eventually you get bogged down and you start getting overwhelmed. So what I did was I developed a practice of daily energy clearing. And there's a number of ways that you can do it. Um, one of the ways that I did it every day for a year was I, uh, I found myself a pendulum, which took quite a while actually <laughs> to find the first pendulum that I really loved. And now I have uh, adore pendulums and I have like 15. But um, I, I, this was not, uh, I didn't know you were going to be asking that question, but I have a pendulum on my desk because <laughs> this is, you know, this is where I, you know, do live shows and I do my own recordings and Zoom calls. And so I happen to have a pendulum. So um, one of the ways that you can do energy clearing is you can use a pendulum if you're familiar with them and you just hold it over your hand and you ask the pendulum to please clear any unwanted energy and your pendulum is going to move. And you're asking the pendulum to do this work for you. And then you can ask your pendulum and stop when you're done. So it'll just move in whatever way. Um, for me, it's a counterclockwise circle when it's doing clearing. And then obviously I have some energy clearing to do. <laughs> and then you can ask it to stop when you're done and then it'll change directions. And when it's done for me, it'll change directions and it'll start swinging back and forth instead of going in circles. So every night before I went to bed for a year, I would do my pendulum energy clearing. And what it does is it kind of gives you gives it's like an energy shower. You just shed all of that unwanted energy from the day. Other ways that you can do it is you can have a crystal um, that you can use or you can use rock. I can't believe I have these tools here that you asked this question. So here's my here's my rock. Um, you can just take any rock from outside and you can just blow into it with the intention of blowing out any unwanted energy. So again, you can just hold the rock in front of you. You can do in you know my empath skills workshop and my video. I teach how to do you know tracking, earth tracking. Um, the, the easiest way is just you know use your intent and blow into the rock. And then what you can do when you're, when you're done is you can put your rock on the ground and you can ask there to transmit that energy. Another really, really simple way is to have a shower. Water will clear your energy. And all you have to do is spend a few seconds with the intent of the water washing away any unwanted energy from you as well. And that clears your um your energy as well as your physical body while you're in the shower. So there are a number of ways. Um, you can do it in the sun if you like being in the sun. Just have the intent of whatever energy you're working with to clear any unwanted energy from your um, energetic or etheric bodies. So that's um, that is my number one tip uh, is daily energy clearing. The other thing that I recommend, uh, probably the strongest. Uh, probably even more than energy clearing is developing self-care practices. So what I understand that self-care is a very popular term, but <laughs> what I do is when, is when I talk about self-care is I share my definition of it. And so my definition of energetic self-care is any practice or technique that honors your energy and fills your energetic reserves, um, whichever energy, energy energy well that you're talking about whether that's your physical mental emotional or spiritual wells or re reservoirs and so energetic self-care does not have to be you know having a bubble bath it's not necessarily what it is if that works for you great that is awesome but for me energetic self-care is um having energetic boundaries and being able you know being comfortable with saying no to people when something is going to be energetically draining. Um, other things that fill my energy wells are um, alone time. 
I'm an extremely introverted person. And so I need to have alone time. It's part of my self-care. Um, reading is also part of my self-care. <laughs> it's not a bubble bath for me. It's just reading stuff that I want to read. And probably the easiest way to fill your energy wells is to realize what fills your spiritual energy well first. And so as a healer and as a seeker, what I've discovered fills my spiritual energy well is teaching. And so whenever I am organizing a masterclass, um, I've organized two really big masterclasses with uh, 20 plus speakers in both of them. And they have six webinars. But at, at the end of the day of the webinar days where I, where I got to teach and I got to organize information and I got to learn, I'm super jazzed. I'm super energetic. And what I found is when you fill your spiritual body well with energy, that energy trickles down into your emotional, mental and physical bodies the easiest. And so um, that would be that would be my other tip for empaths. So first would be daily energy clearing. And the second would be daily self-care practices. Find what fills you up. Do that in whatever way that you can. And the easiest way to fill your energy, to have abundant energy all the time, is to find what fills your spiritual well and do that. Yeah, I so agree because I feel the same thing. Like if I do what I'm here to do, it fills the energy and it activates, it's rejuvenating, it's uh, resetting the whole system. And I'm so full of energy, so happy. And um, my physical body enjoys it as well. So exactly. um, just recently I, I did like a five-day inner family archetype challenge. And um, so I had also like free live question and answer sessions uh, with group coaching. And I was like ready to fly to the moon after those. <laughs> so yeah, because it yeah. was so fun, you know, to share my expertise and be there for people. And then um, while one got an answer to something, someone else was like, oh, my God, like I'm so on the right track. Thank you so much. And it's this communal learning. I think that's the time we are going into now, like, you know, sharing our gifts and and uh, also listening in communal space because that's the fastest way to grow and, and learn. Um, yeah. I just recently heard a really cool uh, proverb uh, from Africans. They say, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And yeah, I think I it's just so, so true. But now um, we slowly start to wrap up. But before we go to the final stage, I wanted to also ask, because I know so many people are still struggling. Um, they have trouble to create like harmony in their lives because there are so many fears. Um, maybe they've lost their jobs. Um, maybe they have family issues right now. Maybe they are like a complete chaos emotionally. And I know you know so much about crystals. So I thought maybe you could share with us like some, um, maybe one to three crystals, which would help us. I mean, I know it's difficult task because everyone is very, you know, unique, but uh, there must be some like more general crystals, which could like help to ground us and find our selves again and find our maybe even find our talent so we can like figure out like how to get out of the disharmony and disease if if that's the case well i love that you put me on the spot because as soon as you said what kind of crystals can we use to help with fear and grounding i was like oh boy <laughs> i have some answers to that okay so um my favorite crystal for grounding uh, is definitely the smoky quartz. So um, smoky quartz is a powerful grounding crystal. 
and can you I have it. Just like, can you just put it like up and hold it in front of the camera for a oh, moment? Oh, I have a, I have a better one. I so okay. this is this is my really big smoky quartz. Wow. Okay. <laughs> So the podcast listeners who are listening, you have to check out the video later so you'll see this beautiful. It's like, oh my God. Well, it's, like it's, also, it's very large. It's um it's larger than my hand. This is uh this is my this is one of the strongest smoky quartz I have. And it si when it comes to crystal size does not matter. <laughs> um mm -hmm. this uh, this is one of my favorites. She has a name. Her name is Freya. She's in a Lestial Smoky Quartz, but um, you don't have to get something, you know, big and splashing like this. Because like I said um, earlier, this tiny little nondescript tumbled Smoky Quartz that Jan Hansen, the energy healer, gave me was powerful enough to wake up my intuitive abilities after they had been asleep for 15 years. So size does not matter. It can be you know, it can be any size, raw, tumbled, a shape, it doesn't matter. Um, like I, I have here, you probably recognize what this is. Yellow tiger eye. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say? Is that the good one for grounding or, you know, protecting away from fear? Well, what I say about crystals is that working with crystals is about intent. And so you can program any crystal to do anything. If you are enamored with yellow tiger eye and it is the crystal that calls for you for grounding and protection, then by all means, use that. What I like to do is I like to give examples of crystals that you could try for whatever purpose. Um, I call them crystal prescriptions. And they can be vast, right? But really, it comes down to what attracts you. What are you being intuitively guided to use for whatever purpose. So if you want to use yellow tiger eye for grounding, by all means, do that. My favorite is smoky quartz. I can give you lots of different examples for grounding. You can use, um, I use, uh, how I like to explain crystal healing is by color. So anything brown, anything black, anything, um, you know, kind of earthy colored, can help you with grounding. Um, I don't like to say protecting from fear. I like to say the opposite of fear is trust. And the way that you get from fear to trust um, is through wisdom. And how you acquire that wisdom is by the application of knowledge. And so if you want to get rid of fear, learn stuff. <laughs> and then apply that, apply what you've learned to gain experience and produce that wisdom. And then trust will just come automatically. So that's kind of my position on fear. I, if you want to use crystals to bring in joy into your life, uh, my favorite crystal to bring in joy is amethyst. Uh, do I have any amethyst? Well, I don't have any amethyst on my desk right now. Um, but that kind of it gives the opposite feeling, right? Because it's hard to be fearful when you're full of joy. And so amethyst would be a really great one. Anything um, anything purple, anything yellow, anything that brings, you know, sunshine and joy. Um, citrine is also a good one. Um, and another favorite crystal of mine for energy stability, energy calming, would be lipidolite. And so... Whenever I do one of these shows, I wear a lipidolite uh, bracelet <laughs> um, because it helps me with being calm emotionally. And lipidolite also kind of looks like that. I also have some on my desk. I have this one here. That looks like purple fluorite. Is it is it purple fluorite? Um, or is it like a variety of purple agate? Yeah, it's some a of those variety are of, yeah, a variety of things, and I don't remember, but this is also one, if I don't wear it, it's just next to me also, so it kind of, like, charges me with, like, support. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Purple is one of my favorite colors, and so um, if you find a crystal of a color that you like, then, like I said, you can program it to do 
whatever you are intuitively guided to program it to do. Does that make sense? I really like your approach. So, um, and that part, what you say, like intention, I think so many of us, we actually are not aware how we can use it. Like not only with crystals, but in general, you know, you open your eyes in the morning and you can just, you know, um, say an intention for the day, you know, and it starts to create that like energetic container for the rest of the day. And then, of course, when you have crystals, you can include them, do or whatever else, you know, anyone has. So, so yeah, that's and when a, you wear them, they can be physical reminders, right, of whatever yeah. intent that you programmed it with. Like, because every time, every time I see the bracelet or it, you know, knocks against something and I feel it again on my wrist, I'm reminded of what I programmed that crystal to do. So, yes, crystals have energy and their energy resonates with yours. And that's how they can help you shift your energy. But there's also... There's also so many aspects of it. The other is that it's a physical representation of what you programmed it to help you with. And so you're reminded of that intent whenever you see it, whenever you feel it. Whenever someone comments, oh, that's a really pretty bracelet. Thank you. <laughs> you're like, oh, that's just, this is what it helps me with. Yeah. I remember I had a period where I had several crystals, crystals under my pillow. And then one day, somehow, that crystal had like walked on the bed like under and ended up under my spine and then I woke up and I was like I almost couldn't move because um, it probably was like hitting the nerve or something and it caused me to take it slower and not like push like I usually do like with training mm -hmm. or whatever and I was so aware like every little move my like back was doing and it was like, first I was like, what the heck was that crystal doing? And then I understood it wanted to give me a lesson, like, hey, crystal, maybe you should like slow down. Maybe, you know, yeah. and then of course, I like took them away underneath the pillow and put them on the side. And one, one of them, I think, completely disappeared. And <laughs> so this is also, I think, very common. I've, I've experienced yeah. this. Some disappear Sometimes and then they, they reappear. Yeah. Yeah. They can yes. break on you as well. Yeah. So yeah. it's like a magical thing. So one other thing which I would like to ask is, I know that uh, you are also in a relationship and um, there is always some tips and tools we can share with others, like, you know, uh, what makes your relationship happy and, you know, harmonic and working and is there anything you would like share as tips and tools for others to use as well? Well, my spouse and I have been together over 20 years. And I guess my biggest relationship tip for long-term relationships is to respect each other's journey and to continue to accept your partner no matter where they are on that journey. So Andrew and I are not the same people that we were when we met 20 years ago. Andrew met me in my third, my fourth year, uh, my fourth of five years in my bachelor's degree. My plan at the time was to finish my bachelor's degree in genetics, do my PhD in neuroscience, do two postdocs outside of Canada, in Europe probably come back to Canada and have my own lab in um, doing research on MS. And that's the person that Andrew met. Um, and then <laughs> what happened was I did, I, I did go into graduate school and the P, what I learned was the PhD was not for me. Academia was not the life that was going to be healthy for me. Um, it, it's a very stressful life being in academia and having your own lab and having your life depend on grant money. And so I learned that that was not my plan. And then I didn't have a plan. And suddenly my partner was with somebody who had no plan. <laughs> and, and then I had this intuitive awakening. And I was another completely different person. And it was really hard. It was really hard for Andrew to eventually, he did eventually come to accept, you know, <laughs> this is my life, this is who I am now. 
but it, you know, when I was going through it, it was really difficult for me. It was really difficult for him. And, you know, he's had to come to accept the new me, um, which is, you know, I'm still me. I'm just on this journey. And Andrew, too, has been on a journey throughout his, you know, our relationship. He is not the same person that he was when we met. And so I've also had to, you know, love and respect and accept his journey, his personal journey. So I guess that would be my number one piece of advice to respect your partner's journey and just be there for them, support them in any way that you can and just, you know, love and accept who they are, no matter where they are in their path. Yeah, I so love what you just said. It's it's almost kind of like reminding us that, you know, every person is a constant uh, changing, you know. Um, We're all works in progress. Journey. Yeah, and, and also, you know, each one of us, we have seasons. We have different things we have to learn. And then if you choose to, you know, go to that journey with that someone special, you know, that's part of it. Like uh, if you chose that, that, you know, just acknowledge that this is part of, of that journey as well. And then understand that there are seasons, you know, they have to figure out this or they have to find a new direction or whatever that is. And then if you are there for them, they can go through it and you can get to the other side together. And then of course, everything has changed because you're so much wiser and, probably also more, you know, um, one would hope wiser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. And to wrap this beautiful conversation up, um, I have this one uh, main question I always like to ask. So imagine now that your physical life in this uh, presence right now comes to an end and um, uh, someone, for example, will look you up and like, okay, who was Tina? And what was her legend or what was her, you know, message she left um, to the world or the gifts? Um, what would you like that to be? Like once you are gone, what would that uh, legend um, be? What would you like that to be? I would like to be remembered as, as a teacher, as someone who gathered knowledge and shared that knowledge freely, freely to help other people empower themselves. Pretty short. Yeah, so <laughs> long story. Beautiful, simple. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, very, very good. We need so many more teachers. So that's uh, such an amazing thing you're doing with the Mystic School and, and all the teachers there as well. And it seems to me, as much as I've heard, like the way it's put together, the way everyone is working together, it's so beautiful. And it's also, you know, one of the ways um, you are learning with the teachers, but also with the students there is co-creation and at the same time, uh, you know, learning and growing together as well. And I think that's, well, that's where the work... Line. That's my tagline. Yeah. Yeah, so you'll and learn and grow together or with yeah, us. Yeah, learn yes. and grow with us. So that's why we are here, and it's really good if we can all learn how to do it even better. So, because that's where the world is going, it's not going to be the hierarchical, you know, um, this and that, it's going to be a little different. So, it's really good you are contributing to that on a big scale and um, uh, so beautifully. So now uh, to wrap it up, you have a really amazing gift you are willing to share with our listeners and viewers. Can you say a couple of words what this is about? Well, I would call this gift the gift of self-discovery. So um, what we have available at Metaphysical School is I've created this quiz to discover your soul path. And so you can go to the website, and I'm sure Crystal will have a website available. And it's a quiz to discover what metaphysical archetype are you. So it will tell you if you are a healer, a seeker, a mystic, or a seer. And how this helps you with your life is uh, a number of things. One, it's, it's a way to progress on your enlightenment journey. 
And it's a way for you to progress on your soul path. So as I mentioned earlier, there are some steps along everybody's soul path as, um, as part of your metaphysical archetype. And if you are interested in finding out if you are a healer, seeker, mystic, and or seer, you can take the quiz. And if you opt in for the um, email part, you will receive a PDF report of your archetype so you can learn even more about yourself. <laughs> and um, there is also an opportunity to take a second version of the quiz um, through the email opt-in part that tells you your percentage results. So we're all primarily um, one archetype. Well, I actually can't say that because after 1,100 people have taken this quiz, I have heard <laughs> from one person who got 25% across the board out of all four. <laughs> so she didn't have she didn't have a lot of direction other than she's all of them. I also feel like I am all of them: the healer, the seeker, the mystic, and the seer. But I'm primarily a seeker, so it helps you learn more about yourself and how to how to align with your soul path and progress on your enlightenment journey. Yeah, I like it so much, like you say, how to align, because uh, so many times we may have like taken onto us, like, you know, other people's projections or expectations. And then we are like uh, doing a completely wrong, like, you know, uh, path or like are working on well, a, a wrong job. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, you're going against yourself, against your soul path and all of the gifts you have inside so it's a really good like a little knock on the door like hey who are you actually like let's look let's see let's discover so little invitation so very very nice so thank you so much Tina it was uh, such a thrill to do this uh, little deeper journey with you and I and all of our listeners viewers we wish you all the best luck with your school and we put all the details also into the notes so uh, with the gift as well so they can check it out and um, I guess they will hear so much more about our co-creations also. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Thank you, Crystal, for letting me share part of myself and the school with you and your listeners. It was such a pleasure to spend this time with you and I look forward to uh, working together again <laughs> yeah very cool and uh, to all of our listeners and viewers um, the final part to always remind you please um, like share write the review and um, be there for us uh, next time when uh, uh, the new episodes go up so uh, enjoy and um, many amazing adventures with crystals or without Thank you.